today's video we're going to take a look at a Preciser 16012 electromechanical adding machine made in Switzerland in the 1960s. Preciser was formed in the 1930s in Zurich, Switzerland and began making mechanical calculators and adding machines around that time. My 16012 adding machine was made in the mid-1960s. There appears to be a date code of 1965 on the motor unit. Precise emerged with the Hermes typewriter company in the 1960s and produced machines badged both as Preciser and Hermes. They stopped making mechanical calculators in the 70s, but the firm still exists to this day making industrial weighing machines. I was attracted to this machine because I like the styling. There are some lovely flowing lines, particularly at the back of the unit, and I think you'd have been pretty excited to have this sitting on your desk at that time. Addition is carried out by entering a number into the keyboard and pressing the large plus button. So if I enter £12.99 and hit plus, you can see that it's printed out the £12.99 in a currency format with a comma separating the last two digits. It has also added that into the accumulator ready for the next number. If I now enter £4.50 and hit plus, it will print the £4.50 and add it to the accumulator as well. Now if I press the diamond or subtotal button, it will print the current total with the diamond next to it, but leave that value in the machine ready for more addition. If I now add £9.99 and press the star or total button, it will print the total of £27.48 with the star next to it, but this time it will have cleared out the accumulator. If I now press the total button again, it just prints a star with no value next to it because the accumulator is now empty. For subtraction, first you need something to subtract from. So I'll enter the £100 and hit plus to add it into the accumulator. Now if I enter £45 and hit the minus button, it will print the £45 in red with a minus next to it to indicate that it was a minus figure. If I now press the subtotal button, it will show the £55 with the diamond next to it to indicate that this is a subtotal. If I now enter £56 and hit the minus button, followed by the subtotal button, it will print £1 in red with a diamond and a minus to indicate that the current total is a minus value. The R button on the keyboard is the repeat button. Pressing this simultaneously with either the plus or minus button allows you to enter the same number multiple times. You can use this to do multiplication. If I want to multiply 426 by 385, I'll enter the 426 and then I'll press the R and plus buttons, keeping them held until the machine has added the number five times. Next, I'll add a zero to the 426, so I'll now be multiplying in the tens column. And now I'll press the R and plus buttons again, and keep them held until the number has been added eight times. And finally, I'll add another zero and press the R and plus button until the machine has added three times. If I now press the subtotal button, you can see the answer of 164,010. You have to ignore the currency format commas and just read the numbers themselves, otherwise it can get a bit confusing. The hash button is the non-add button. This can be used to insert a reference number such as a customer's account number without affecting the calculation. So if I enter 159357 and hit the hash key, it will be printed out with the hash symbol to indicate that this is a reference number only. If I print a total now, you'll see that there's no value in the accumulator, it just shows the star. I can now carry on with the rest of my calculations, leaving the non-added number showing at the top. You'll notice that there are three zero keys on the keyboard. These are simply there to speed up data entry when you need multiple zeros in a number. You've got the option of one zero, two zeros, or three zeros. 
This machine has a 12 digit input register, so I can enter 123 456 789 012 and hit the add button, you can see it printed out. But it can actually handle 13 digits in the accumulator. So if I fill it full of 12 nines and then add those in 10 times and print a subtotal, you'll see a 13-digit answer of 99,999,999,999 pounds and 90 pence. So if I add 9 pence and then press the subtotal, this is the largest number that the machine can handle. If I now add 1 pence more and press the subtotal again, it just gives an answer of 1 pence. And that would be the same if I print a grand total, because the machine is in effect reset to zero when it overflows. The input register has a clear button, so if I'm adding some figures and I realise that I've entered one of the numbers incorrectly, before I press the plus key, I can clear that entry by pressing the C button and then carry on with the correct number. You can see that there's a marker to let you know how many digits you've entered. So if I fill it up to the 12 digits, the marker goes all the way over to the left, and then returns to the right hand side when I clear the entry or perform a normal calculation. It's fairly normal practice when you want to start a calculation on one of these machines to press the C button to clear the input register and press the total button to clear the accumulator, just in case someone has left a calculation in the machine. Of course, the big advantage of these electrically powered machines over the hand cranked versions was the speed that you could enter a series of numbers. So if I try adding 1299 and 450 and 125 and 20 pounds and 326, I only need to tap the plus button between entries, and the total is, of course, 42 pounds. Now if I try the same calculation on this Decimo hand cranked adding machine, after entering each amount I have to reach round and pull the handle. So 1299 and 450 and 125 and 20 pounds and 3 pound 26. And sure enough, the Precisor took 6.5 seconds, while the Decimo took a whopping 8.8 .8 seconds, excluding printing the total for both machines. So someone who is good at entering numbers could fairly fly through the figures using one of these machines. It doesn't make that much difference for me because I'm kind of slow whichever machine I use. Similar to a typewriter, there's a wheel to advance the platen roller on top of the machine, and a lever that releases the pressure so you can align the paper or change the roll. So now I think we can take a look at the inside of the unit. The cover flips open to allow access to the ink ribbon itself. You've got the two spools containing the inked ribbon, which you'd need to replace from time to time. This part is the marker that indicates how many digits you've entered, and the printing number wheels are situated behind this plate. The case is quite a clever design. You've got the flip-up cover section that we've already looked at, but the lower section is a single casting. It's just painted in two different colours to give the impression that it's in two parts. To remove the cover, you have to withdraw the pivot post. There's a slot in the shaft so you can move it sideways, and then it just pulls out, allowing the cover to be removed. Albeit with a little bit of jiggling along the way. It's a fairly tight fit, which is probably a good thing, because you wouldn't want it working loose while you were using the machine. With the cover removed, I'll just reinsert the pivot. You can see that it not only secures the cover, but it also holds the mechanism in place by passing through holes in the chassis. The front of the mechanism pushes onto some posts in the case, and you just need to pull it backwards to release it, and then it simply lifts out. And here's the chassis, which, with the exception of the roll holder, can operate completely independently of the case. 
If I now turn it round to the drive side, you can see the motor unit, which is a self-contained unit made of plastic and completely electrically isolated from the rest of the machine. The motor unit is held in place by two circlips, one at the back and one tucked underneath at the front. So I'll just remove these, and that was well done. I'll just locate the circlip that flew off somewhere around the room. It's easier to get to the front circlip if you tip the machine on its side, and I'll try not to ping this one off into orbit. And finally, with the circlips removed, you can gently slide the motor unit off its mounting posts thusly. Drive is transferred from the motor unit to the rest of the mechanism by this nylon disc. It fits onto two metal prongs on the motor, and there's another pair of prongs on the mechanism that fits into these other slots. This system allows for a small amount of misalignment between the two sections. The motor is turned on and off by this sliding plate. It's electrically isolated by a piece of plastic here. The sliding plate is held in the off position until you press one of the red buttons, at which point the motor is turned on for one cycle of the machine, and then it's turned off again. If I flip the unit round, you can see the motor itself here, with a cooling fan at the front. There's a fuse at the back and a gearbox in the section beneath the fuse. There also appears to be a centrifugal governor in the front section, but I haven't stripped this apart yet. At the very back is the power connector socket. Now we can look at the main mechanism itself. This lever at the bottom is the one that holds the motor switch in the off position, and here is the drive coupling with the prongs that fit into the nylon disc. This coupling is free to rotate until one of the red buttons is pressed, at which point the lever will move, turning the motor on, and it will also release a second lever that engages the drive coupling with the rest of the machine. So if I press one of the red buttons, you'll see the bottom lever moves, and this spring-loaded lever is released to engage with the rest of the drive. Now I can turn the machine over by hand, and at the end of one revolution, the drive is disengaged and the motor is switched off again. By disengaging the drive after one revolution, the motor can coast to a halt without the need for a precision system to make it stop in the correct place. Looking at the underside of the machine, you can see the racks that make up the input register. These extend downwards out of the frame where they interact with the number wheels and the accumulator. If I enter the numbers 1 to 9 on the keyboard, you'll see the plate above moving to the left. This plate lowers pins that stop the racks moving beyond the number that's been entered. So I'll press the plus button and turn the machine over by hand and you'll see the racks move with the highest number on the right hand side. The left three racks don't move at all because I only entered 9 out of the 12 available digits. Moving down the machine, these toothed wheels form part of the accumulator, with the lower end of the racks behind. If I again enter the numbers 1 to 9 and turn the machine over by hand, you'll see the racks move down. At this stage, they've also moved the printing wheels into the correct position. Then once the machine has printed, the accumulator is moved against the racks, and then the racks return to their start position, transferring their values into the accumulator. This process will be repeated as you add more numbers. Next, if you want a subtotal, the accumulator is moved against the racks before they start moving. Then, when the racks move, the number held in the accumulator is transferred to the racks, and as the racks are also connected to the printing wheels, this will be the value that's printed out. The accumulator is left engaged with the racks, so when they return to their start position, the current total is again transferred to the accumulator. Finally, if I press the total button, again the accumulator is moved against the racks, and when the racks move, the total held in the accumulator is transferred onto the racks. 
but this time, once the machine has printed, the accumulator is moved away from the racks before they return to their start position, leaving the accumulator at zero. So I think the next thing to do is have a look at the preciser running out of the case. You can't see that much on this machine because the motor unit and the side frames hide much of the workings, but I'll shut up for a minute so you can enjoy the mechanical greatness of the sound. I only intended this to be a short overview of the Preciser, but it's ended up as a 17 minute marathon, so I think I'll wrap it up at that. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe to the channel, there'll be plenty more vintage stuff coming soon. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.